Welcome to the Lightweight Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Jacob Hanchar. Jacob is the CEO of Digital Dream Labs and the head scooper at Clavon's Ice Cream Parlor right earlier today. Jacob, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Good to have you. I've heard a lot of stuff about uh, sort of your work over the years, but haven't had a whole lot of actual direct interactions with uh, Digital Dream Labs folks or, or like a whole lot of stuff. So I'm really excited to learn about kind of what you're up to and how you got there. Um, you have a really interesting background. There's so many questions I want to ask you. I guess... Uh, we got all night. Sweet. Yeah, I'm into it. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I was, I was reading your LinkedIn just trying to do my diligence. And one of the things that struck me as interesting is that you've got both an ice cream parlor and a robotics company that you're running. Um, you got to be the only motherfucker I know in Pittsburgh that's doing that or anywhere else probably in the world. Uh, and it looks like you started started around the same time. Like, what made you decide to bite those projects off simultaneously? Yeah, um, maybe just trying to recapture my childhood, right? You know, this, this, this obsession with Transformers and, you know, loving Dairy Queen when I was a little kid. I, you know, so, something to that effect. Um, I think the... Uh, it just It just happened. It wasn't planned, and that's... Pretty much what I've discovered, just in general, um, w with life, is that a lot of the things, you know, you have a plan and God laughs, right? Like that's the old the old saying. <laughs> and, yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. And so, I would say that the the ice cream parlor was an interesting idea that, that my wife had. She wanted to have a kid friendly business. Cool. And with the kid-friendly business, we thought, okay, let's take a look. And so we looked around town, and this was whenever we just had two kids at the at the time. We have six now, so she's very busy. Wow, but she was, Thank you. She was concerned. Um, she was concerned at the time that, oh no, I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom, and uh, you know what am I going to do with myself? And you know, I want to do something. I want to do something. Uh, in addition to being a stay-at-home mom, so let's you know, let's take a look at something that she would love, but the children would love as well. Okay, cool, great. Um, took a look at a lot of kid-friendly businesses. I mean, it just hammer everything hemorrhaged cash. It was, it was crazy, brutal, uh, brutal. Yes, and you know, retail has only gotten worse. Brick and mortar has only gotten worse uh, to the point where you wonder: it, it really are is it could just be restaurants that are going to be left? And is everything else just going to be shopping online anymore? Like you start wondering. Seems to that, be. Right? It seems to be heading in that direction. So, um, so we we look looked around at various businesses. Clavons popped up. It looked like they were going like there was an outside firm that was going to you know, renovate the whole place and kind of you lose that Pittsburgh history. So, um, yeah, that was a really cool spot, but like just. It looked pretty like vintage. I yes. Guess. What, what was that before it was Clavon's? Yeah. So so yeah. So Clavon's. So the history going back in the history, in 1885, that's when the building was built. Wow. And then yeah, Mary Shenley. So Shenley Park and all that stuff. This yeah. wealthy um, uh, philanthropist. She you know she donated a lot of land, and, uh, but this was her office building. And so when she passed away, it fell into her trust, and then it was in her trust for many years. And then a guy named uh, James Clavon uh, passed away, and or not, excuse me, when she passed away, went into her trust. Then James Clavon, um, when he graduated uh, Pittsburgh Medical School, he bought the building, turned it into a pharmacy, and ran it as a oh, pharmacy. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was an actual pharmacy. So, when, they, Do you know when this was, like, roughly in terms of decade? Yeah, so in the 20s. So, 19, so this would have been, like, a probably a back alley, like, speak as well as a pharmacy. It, just was, given the, it okay. was. There was actually a raid. That's uh, cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. There's all kinds of history. That's what's so cool about this place. There's so much history with it. But there was. There was a, uh, there was a raid because uh, there was a little bit too much alcohol in one of his elixirs or something like that. <laughs> Well, yeah. and, I mean, my aunt has, like, a bunch of medical whiskey bottles from those. It's, it's hilarious the things people did to get around those right. laws. Yeah. Right, and that's exactly what was going on there. Like, ooh, medicinal whiskey or whatever. So, um, Doctor, I got a problem. I'm too sober. <laughs> you know, it can, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a problem. Uh, so, um, <laughs> the, yeah, so, let's say the, the story concludes 
with um, him opening the store. Uh, there's all kinds of other like, um, let's call it like, like little like side stories. Like there was the sure. 19, 1936. So James had one son, Ray, and Ray got trapped during the flood of 1936. So he crawled up through a window and escaped and popped out and a rowboat came by and saved his life. So, nice. Yeah, so later on, uh, Ray had, he had eight children. This was at the same venue? like. Yeah, this is okay, all, wow. this is all the building. This is all history that surrounds the building. It's incredible. Yeah, and it's, it's, it, there's just, there's so many stories. And everything from, you know, the raids of the Prohibition to being saved from a flood in a rowboat to all kinds of things. We even did a little after a speakeasy drink called After the Flood, you know, just, you <laughs> That's know, awesome. after you go through all that, yeah, like you need to unwind. So, um, yeah, just, just, just lots and lots of history uh, surrounding that place. That's what, what's so great about it and why we fell in love with the place. Anyway, fast forward to 1979, whenever um, uh, the steel industry is kind of leaving Pittsburgh, and so they shutter the place. It remains closed, and essentially it was a time capsule. And in 1999, Ray Jr., so Ray's uh, son or James' grandson, Got it. opens the place up and then essentially just starts serving ice cream. And everyone is kind of really into it. And, and this he, is 99. Yeah, 99. And then yeah. he, he, runs it, he runs it for a number of years. And then eventually he passes away of um, uh, lung cancer. And then uh, the family tries to deal with it, but it's a labor of love. It's extremely labor intensive, very time consuming. Um, so they they sell it. And so in the, getting back to what I was mentioning, an outside firm, uh, they were gonna probably gut the place. And I just, we couldn't, we didn't want that to happen. So nice. we purchased the place, didn't touch it, got the ice cream business back to where it was and have been slinging ice cream ever since. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so believe it or not, so you were talking about, yeah, only doing doing these two things at once. I made the decision a couple of months ago, like, I really need to start putting more effort into uh, digital dream labs. Just too many things are f slipping through the cracks. One thing that I'm really bad at is is delegating, but also another thing, like, I need to follow up better. So it's like a, there's a fine balance. Yeah, for so, sure. So we actually listed the I've place. I've made the mistake of over-delegating quite a few times. Yeah, and there's you're always trying to figure that out, right? So the, um, the yeah, so we list it, and it looks like knock on wood, we have a buyer who has the right attitude, awesome, uh, wants to buy the business and the building, and just keep it as it is and expand it and all that good stuff. So that's great. So we're negotiating. It looks like it'll be a good exit for from you know us uh, after about nine years of running the place. Sweet. And so that's good luck. Thank you. Yeah. So well, you know, there's a window there. I'm going to take the window, you know, get the get the return on investment, and uh, and then it'll be in good hands. So that's awesome. That's where Clavon's now is kind of coming together is keeping history at the same time. Where I'm making a good return, and everyone can keep having delicious ice cream down in the strip. Sweet. So that's so that's yeah, the it was story. super cool that's, place. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, so that's the story behind Clavon's. So that's kind of in a, in you know a, um, a summary a summary Cliff Notes version. Um, Digital Dream Labs, I met some engineers when I was at, doing my MBA at Carnegie Mellon. So I just finished my uh, PhD in neuroscience at UCLA. Oh, cool. And I was thinking, like, hey, I need another degree. Um, but really, I wanted to, I, I went and I commercialized a, a drug. spend the stipend I got on a master's. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, what was nice is like, yeah, I got a, uh, essentially a free ride at UCLA, got paid a stipend too. It was fantastic. Uh, wonderful experience. Sweet. I, yeah. I don't think I've ever raised kids in LA. I, LA is an interesting place. I used to, I interned at SpaceX like a while back. And okay. so I, I lived there for three months and I got. What was that like? It was, it was arduous. Uh, <laughs> I'll put it that. Okay. My first Friday was a 19 hour day. Um, but it was interesting. Like it was a really, really cool experience. I don't think I would trade it. Um, okay. if, I, if I had to do all over again, I would do everything the same way. Um, it, was a bit of a rock star uh, culture there. So meaning like, um, you know, it was, so the vibe was work hard, play hard, uh, which okay. is kind of cliche in the startup right. world, but that right. was what they practiced and preached. And then um, 
they had corporate housing in a place in Playa Vista and a place in Marina del Rey. They've probably since expanded since they're way larger now. Mm. But um, it was interesting because we shared... So I started in Playa and then I moved to Marina and we shared the Marina del Rey building with a language school. So there were people from all over the world that were coming to learn English. And there's a guy named Ray from Switzerland that I met there. I, I would hang... I've always had this thing where I wanted to hang out with people like outside of the thing I was doing. So when I was yeah. getting my master's in robotics at CMU, yeah, yeah. I would hang out with the design students because it was like kind of contrary. And okay. when I was working at SpaceX, I, I'd hang out with the other SpaceX people. I still have some really, really good friends that I met there through that program. Uh, I was talking to one earlier today. But at the same time, um, like I also was like, oh, let me meet these people that are coming here to learn English and see what they're all about. Or let me see these people... You know that are aspiring actors and figure out what their backstory is. And, yeah. You know, um, you know. Let's let's just dive into a random subculture is kind of something I enjoy. So um, yeah, that was that was quite a good time actually. I ended up going to Switzerland and hanging out with a bunch of the folks I met in my eye. You know, and where they came from. One guy um, had the best American accent. So this is like so tangential, but mm. that's kind of how this this podcast goes is we just kind of go off on random yeah. you know it's just having fun so anyway so um this one guy ray just you know i, I didn't think he was in this program because his accent was perfect you know mm -hmm. and it was just sounded like he was from la yeah and i'm like how long do you been speak english for he goes one year it's like fuck me you know that's crazy, crazy. crazy. and so i'm like well what made you decide to want to learn english and he goes well i, I really liked nwa and easy e and mm -hmm. uh <laughs> You know, just all this old school hip hop, you know, right. from the 90s. And he goes, uh, I wanted to know what they were saying in these songs, so I decided to learn English. <laughs> so, I thought that was an amazing motivation. I'm it also is. an old school hip hop fan. So. It is. That, that actually, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, Compton's like really gentrifying, speaking of that vein. Um, great, I, great place to visit these days. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, um, it was interesting when I when I first moved to um, LA, I was relatively naive uh, when it came to the uh, various neighborhoods and things like that. And uh, there was this great taco stand. Oh, there's so found, many, right? And there, it, and it's uh, it was it was right on. Um, uh, it's it's considered a day quote unquote a dangerous neighborhood. Uh, considered <laughs> one, but at the time I didn't really care or even know like there were all yeah. these d divisions. So I would go and get in this taco stand. It almost became a ritual. Like after like Friday, it was one time where I just go by myself, get a taco, just hang out and just uh, just chill. And that's a great time. Yeah, and you know, early twenties stuff like that. And then of course, then yeah. I would go and meet up with. My, my classmates or you know, friends like that, that we would go, go like, hit the, the bars, bars or what have you. Um, For sure, there's a lot of great ones yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The so, beach bars, are like, they don't have that around here. I know, I know, right? That's, well, we're, I guess we'll have to work on that uh, with the Pittsburgh and the nightlife. It's still yeah. kind of laggy there, but... Concur. Yeah, it's so... Yeah, everything shuts off as soon as the sun sets here, man. I live in Squirrel Hill, it's brutal. Yeah, yeah, like, you can't even get a decent deli sandwich. I feel like Lawrenceville's kind of, like, the exception, but even they close down at, like, 11 p.m. Yeah, yeah, you're not... Yeah, you're just not going to find a place that opens... Like, like Madrid, Madrid, for example. Then, oh, you know, like four a.m. Right? Sure, <laughs> yeah, but nothing opens till ten a.m. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Madrid's a great city. I love it there too. Yeah, it was, that's, I just think of the, these these polar opposites. Anyway, getting back to the the, the taco story. So, um, they kept calling. So eventually, I heard the whisper. This is after a couple of times. Uh, some of the you know the waiters and whatever started whispering, and they were calling me Mister Five O. And <laughs> like. I didn't get it, and, and, and then I looked around, and I didn't realize I was like, you know, the only white person there, it didn't even dawn on me. Right? I used to get that a lot when I was in East Cleveland, yeah, like, people would think I was a cop, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's like, of course, like, yeah, of course a cop would say that, you know, so, um, and, and that's just it, it's like, oh, yeah, and, and so, but I said, okay, so, because I go there and I'm not scared, I guess, was, was the reason they, they thought I was 5-0. Like, just, okay, That's fine. fucking stupid. Yeah, I, I thought so, too. I thought so, too, but whatever. And then, um, and I said, well, what's the mister? Okay, I'll buy the whole you think I'm a cop. Okay, great. Why not Officer 5-0? Yeah, right, right. Like, why, why the mister? Why the mister? He said, oh, because you're so polite. 
I thought, okay, all right, I guess, I guess, I guess that, that makes sense. So, <laughs> uh, I'll never, I'll never Mr. Five O. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, Don and Doug. I get a buddy whose nickname is Gringo. So he, he's a chef. I, I, you, you ever go to a place called Fukuda in Lawrenceville? It's a sushi place that's. It was around maybe like six, seven years ago. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So who owned it? Yeah. It was, it was fun. The place, the people that started Dianoyas, uh, were like regulars. It was the third biggest spender there after the Chinese mafia, and the Dianoyas family. <laughs> so, yeah, in that order. <laughs> so, I would go in there. I, I just loved it so much, and like, it was it was just such a great little like, just for the drama. Like I, I'm not like a guy to watch like you know like drama television, or that, but like I love going into a sushi bar and just bullshitting with people and you know just you know slice of life if that's kind of cliche, but yeah, you know just just to just to hang out and um, yeah. I don't know why. Why did I bring that up? I had I had a reason and it totally was escaping me. Uh, we're, we're talking, talking about, um... Mr. Five-O. Yeah, the cops. Compton, L.A. The LA chef was from San, San Diego, Diego, but I don't think that was... Um, hanging out. Oh, one of the, the, the guest chefs that would come in, um, he was this, like... He's cool, Greg Fitzgerald, he's still a really good friend of mine. Uh, he lives right down the street from the studio. But, um... The guy is great. Like he, um, he's been a chef since he was like an early teenager. He would save his money, you know, and and just buy rental property after rental property after rental property and just build it up. And um, you know, he uh, these days he just doesn't have to work. And he didn't when he was working there either. But he enjoys cooking and he's really good at it. Like when I am at like one of those guy that guy's barbecues, like you can see the smoke coming off his knife because he's so fast. Right. When he goes, but um, anyway, his nickname is Gringo in the kitchen because he's like the only white dude in like the kitchens he works in. So that's that's why I thought of that. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just, 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 just yeah, King Taco, um, is the name of the place. Oh, dude, uh, the Living Legends talk about that place in After Hours. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was King Taco. Yeah, the line is like, I'm going to King Taco in East L.A., I'll see your sister there. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think it's more than one location now. I think, yeah, um, I think there is. Anyway, that's, yeah, that's, the, I think, I think that's the name of the place. Anyway, I, I was just bumming around various neighborhoods and stuff like that, naive in, in L.A. and uh, just I had a good talk. It just, it's, it's a great, great it's a great city. city. I mean, especially for young men. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I found I was I was very body conscious when I lived there. So I was going to the gym for an hour every day. I was in better shape than I've ever been in my life. I looked like an hourglass, but I was the most self conscious ever. Because I mean, you're around supermodels like all day long and like people that are being actors. And they're working at burger shops because, like, you know, they're not good enough. And so you, you just feel like a total piece of garbage. <laughs> and so that was an interesting thing. Um, you mentioned SpaceX. So to get back to that, I sat in the prototype to the Man Dragon capsule before it was announced publicly. Like, this would have been in 2013. Okay. So that was a hell of an experience. Like, me and a buddy would, like, sit in the seats for that and make engine sounds during our lunch breaks, you know, and just goof around because <laughs> they they opened it up to the employees so they, there was a staircase you could walk in you could see the tesla displays in there they had the 19 inch um touch screen and they had them at every console there were five seats and then um you know it was an early prototype i mean they've probably since iterated but the controls were really interesting i think i think it was like some kind of joystick i, I can't remember exactly what the orientation was but it was fun to sit in that seat and you know like picture yourself on a space mission like, I can't enjoy science museums anymore. Like, when I was a kid, I loved the Carnegie Science Center growing up in Squirrel Hill. And after having worked on the space program in some small way, like, I want to see the new shit. Like, that was, right. <laughs> I've seen the old shit. Right, yeah. right, right, yeah. And having so, that chance of Vanguard, that's right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, you see this with the stuff you work on Digital Dream Labs. I mean, you know, you probably working on all sorts of bleeding edge things. I mean, I, I have, you know, a bunch of things I've seen I can't talk about, but, you know, I, they're up here. And, um, you know, it's just, like you said, it's the vanguard. It's, it's, you know, the, it's just interesting to be, it's a great time to be alive as, as somebody working in the tech field. And so, you know, I, mm -hmm. I consider myself lucky to, to be able to, to have those experiences. Yep, I agree. Um, it is a privilege. Uh, despite all the issues and the problems we have and 
all of those things. I just, I always think of it. So um, I'm Ukrainian in descent. Cool. And uh, we still have some distant relatives in, in, the, in the old country. Looking into selling weapon systems to those guys right now. <sighs> well, so that's just it. Like, you know, one of our um, partners, Dragonfly, so they do drones. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're sending rescue that's what we're thinking of doing. things like that. Hmm? That's what we're thinking of doing. Uh, well, they, they need more, uh, that's for sure. And their funds are headed in that direction. So they're... Um, yeah, so Dragonfly is one of our partners. We're we're building like a uh, cutesy little you know toy, uh, kind of like stem robotic. Is this the Rick and Morty shtick? Or? No, Rick and Morty. That's that's butter robots. That's yeah. Totally I heard about that. that. That's, that I've... that's getting your butter off the the kitchen table. That is, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's totally different. No, this this thing is a little drum that's almost like a hummingbird. And oh, interesting. Called Kavu. And it kind of flies. I haven't seen this one yet. This, this sounds really cool. Okay, yeah. I like there more. Yeah, so, well, go go to our, um, uh, so, Cosmo and Friends. Go check out Cosmo and Friends on YouTube. You'll see our cast of characters that we're building now. That's cool. So, so Wismo, Breezmo, or not, uh, Wismo, we got Kavu, we got a bunch of the cartoon characters. We It's it's expanding. Uh, it's, it's, That's it's awesome. It's expanding pretty well. We have... Well, I remember when Anki owned that IP, like every venture capitalist and their mother had a Cosmo and... That's what I thought was really interesting about you is that you've acquired interesting stuff and then built on it. And right. So, yeah. That's the... So, yeah, that's that's the idea. So, with the... Uh, with the Anki IP, there was a lot... Of, there were a lot of patents that weren't finished. So, that was one thing that I, I, I did initially just like, okay, let's round up some of this stuff and it was like teaching myself for bus because I'm a neuroscientist at the end of the day. So, I'm like, yeah. all right, what do, I, what do I do here? And then also, how do I correct the business model? Because the... The business model, you know, with 40, 50% margins on a hardware product, I mean, it's brutal. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. So we instituted a you know, subscription model, which created a lot of friction. Um, but now it seems to be status quo. Nice. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> so, well, everybody so we, wants to own a SaaS company. Nobody wants to pay a subscription for their software is kind of the, the joke, right? That is exactly right. Yeah. And so we were able to break through that wall. And believe me, we wouldn't be around, we would not be here today if we had not instituted that SaaS model. Beautiful. Yeah, for sure. And then the next thing is the license, licensing model, like have some licensing revenue come in. And that's where the cartoon uh, comes in. Now all of a sudden, I don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars advertising. Cartoon's doing that for me and <laughs> it's bringing in revenue, right? That's so, awesome. So now we have these additional revenue streams that now make how did you approach like Justin Roiland at all about like getting that? He found us. Are you fucking serious? Found us. Yeah. He saw. He said, "Look, look, I saw what you did. Uh, you know that took guts. So uh, I'm interested in. I've been wanting someone to build this robot for me, and we're like, okay, yeah, we'll do it. And so that's actually, awesome. So actually, we have the final prototype. It's done. The final prototype we've gone through. I don't think like twenty iterations by now." Nice. Uh, I mean, this is product, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, and so we're we're actually seeking his approval um, this week or next, and after that, we're going to get the blessing from Warner Brothers, and then we're going to go to mass production. That's awesome. Yeah, Phew, boy, it almost killed us. Um, but yeah, all the <laughs> tooling sorry. and all that stuff. That's just it, man. A lot of people don't understand how. Well, production and R and D are totally different things. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. Go, go for it, please. Yes, talk about the difference between R and D and production because it's a doozy. So that's a prop for a <laughs> <laughs> fake industrial disaster we made for an ASME event. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So the idea was originally to um, be able to. Um, so it was the ASME Inspection Rate Maintenance Robot Summit in 2020 when nobody was going out. It was a virtual event we sponsored for that year. Okay. And um, for this one, uh, nobody was engaging in any one of these events. I mean, you remember what it was like. Yeah. It was fucking brutal. Yeah. And so, you know, we wanted to um, see if we could cut through that. And so we hired an Outer Work Broadway set designer because nobody was Broadway shows all got shut down. Um, and she was actually my assistant at the time, um, but you know I wanted to give her a project that was kind of in her craft, mm -hmm. and so um, she designed this whole set, uh, which is a simulated industrial disaster for those who can't see it. And um, basically, it's it's like a maze for robots, and um, we created like a, a 
you know, five kilogram robot, 10 pounds. And that's designed to go through the maze. Uh, all this was put together in like a quarter and um, it is very, very just quick turn, you know, let's, let's see what we can do here. And um, yeah, and I mean, it, it, the people that used it really enjoyed it. I wish we'd gotten higher engagement. We were giving away FPV drones as prizes to people that won this competition. Initially, it was spot the dangers to human life. And so use this robot to drive through our, our course and figure out the things that could kill a person. Mm. So inside that tunnel, there was a simulated high pressure steam leak because in industrial you know, environments, you'll get steam that can cut a person in half. Sure. Yeah. And you know, then there was a simulated hydrogen sulfide leak. Yeah. You can see over there, the signs, we had that uh, light flashing. And then uh, that's actually a field robotic center dumpster dive on the light. <laughs> Um, we have, uh, it's underneath there, but okay. then we, we had, uh, a, uh, they're trying to do like a depressurized valve and then a pressurized one. So you could, you know, if you're you have an engineering background, you could deduce that something's gone wrong here yeah. and there's probably hydrogen sulfide around. We didn't actually put that in the shop. And then we had a broken cable tray with a wire hanging down. And I wanted to originally have sparks coming off that wire, like onto a puddle. Um. And so we had a two kilovolt power supply that's behind there. Because uh, to actually get a spark, you need quite a lot of juice. I was um, say, yeah. But uh, the problem with that was that the spark gap uh, jammed our Wi-Fi, and people couldn't control the robot. <laughs> so we made it inert for the actual real life demo. That's that's actually kind of funny. Yeah. So, so a bunch of people. There was there was um, sort of a, a a running bet with the engineering team. Like, is this gonna work from a communications perspective and it turns out the people that thought it wasn't were right I lost that one personally <laughs> so. anyway I want to hear your take on production versus like development because um, um, I, I kind of was rambling and then we sort of cut that but yeah we're well I've made a, I, I've made so many mistakes as we all have oh I, I, my god it takes uh, balls to admit it though I mean, <laughs> most people are like oh everything I've done is perfect I'm like fuck you no it's yeah, not no and yeah. and and, and, and it's not over yet. <laughs> so it's, well, amen. And it never ends. So I, I actually, I, I just to to sort of you know, I, I think we're very like minded in this way. So I always say I don't mind making a mistake so long as I learn from it. I keep a journal of mistakes and lessons learned. Um, every time I fuck up horribly, I will write a journal entry and then I will add bullet points to this list. And the idea is, if I follow every bullet point on this list, I will not repeat those mistakes. And so. Um, I hosted a Pittsburgh Robotics Network panel discussion um, where I was the moderator, and it was uh, Jurgen Pedersen from RE Squared and um, a representative from Gecko Robotics, and then another rep from, um, what is it, Advanced Construction Robotics. And it was, ba it was basically like, name a time you really screwed up poorly in field robotics, because we all have. Yeah. And the amount of pushback I got on that con, nobody wanted to admit fault. What? In a public forum, right? And I, I was trying to... My, my logic is, like, we all do it. I mean, to, to err is human. I mean, that, like, who the hell said... It was... I think that was, like, yeah. like Napoleon or... I can't to, remember to, the fuck To err is that. human? It's every philosopher... <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> I, I, yeah, but uh, err is human. Yeah, and to something divine. I forget what the, 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 the... There's something else to admit it's divine or something like that. Uh, why, why, why would they not admit to mistakes? I think a lot of people were concerned about brand dilution. And so like, it's like if we admit fault, people aren't going to hire us was the fear. Hmm. And so, um, I don't know. Like, like, I'm not going to point fingers at anyone in particular, but across the board, I mean, it seemed to be a concern. Interesting. Well, so we have, you know, we have a, a Facebook page of our fans, our hardcore fans of like 25,000 or something like that. That us. Well, they, 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 believe me, they do not let me forget I've made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they, they are quick to point out what's going wrong. And uh, that's actually, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard of this concept of a DAO, right? Where it's like a you know, distributed autonomous organization. Okay. And there's, there's all kinds of problems with it. There's been, it's, it's, it's another kind of like, almost like Bitcoin scam kind of thing, if you will. But in this case, it happens to be real because you actually have... It should be a tennis organization. So can you, can you be like more specific as to what that looks like? Yeah, so... Um, like I work well with examples, just personally. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I know. And I, I already went, I already went, 
shooters off in the left field. All nah, it's all good. It's all good. I just want to make sure I'm tracking. <laughs> yeah, so so what it is, it, and I'll, it's, it's a bunch of people all across the world who are... In, you know, involved in, um, thank you. You're um, welcome. It, it could be any industry, okay? It could be any industry. So it's a board, it's basically a board with lots and lots and lots of members, essentially, bottom line. So yeah. it's, it's distributed. So there's no responsibility. Correct. So, yeah. and that's why it's distributed and they consider it autonomous. I'm on a board like that. I won't say which one. <laughs> yeah, but, but so, but that's just it. Like, and then people feed in into it and then a decision is made however many people want to get involved in making that decision and then and then the next then the next project's done so it's almost like people who are shopping at amazon for example tell amazon what products to carry but are organized in some fashion okay so like uh of course amazon it has an algorithm they can tell what are the popular products which ones aren't right but in this case, you reverse it. Now you have the customers coming and saying, like, look, we are only going to buy X. We are only going to buy Z and things like that and to the point where you're actually using this for a management of a company. Wait, so you're just diverting to a computer and you're saying this is what customers seem to enjoy based on this machine learning algorithm that we've commissioned from McKinsey. And so we're going to I mean, probably Amazon hires their own folks, but you know what I mean? And that essentially yeah. it essentially runs your company, so it's almost like interesting. It's yeah, it's 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 a it's a compilation of thousands of people. And I'm probably not you know explaining this well enough um, for the person who came up with this. Probably there, if they were ever to listen, it's like this guy does has no idea what he's talking about. But the send all hate mail. Yeah, it's all hate mail. <laughs> like, believe me, I get it all the time. It's fantastic, uh, even, but the good ones are great. Um, That's hilarious. The, but yeah, the distributed. So it's autonomous. So therefore, it's you know relatively unrestricted, distributed, meaning there's there are a bunch of people all over all over the place. But at the same time, they are organized under like they're they're behaving like there is a uh, purpose, and essentially it just means a giant board, okay, that you know is running an organization. Um, however, where you, there's no direct responsibility because you can't correct, have that with that sort of correct, structure. That's right, and that's the idea. Yeah. And so the thought, the theory there is um, now you know it should be able to run better in theory because well, I, I've heard you want to create a culture of accountability with those sort of projects, and I don't know if I buy it fully <laughs> being upfront. Yeah. Anyway, be that as it may, I think accountability in like hiding behind computer screens and stuff like that, like I'm against, like against the trolls and I'm against <laughs> and so that stuff. However, having said that, there they it can have be quite funny sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the yeah the, the the concept is that you have an organization now that has a lot more stakeholders and in theory than can actually like manage products or oh, I suggestions see. or things like so that. So because you've brought in so many different people with backgrounds and different things, you've got diversity, therefore you've got intelligence, therefore you can make better decisions. In theory. Correct. But like you said, the autonomous part of it is um, and, and the idea that you're kind of cloaking your, you can, you know, your gender, what have you. Again, it, it's, contra- like I said, it's controversial, but I feel like I have that and we have a huge board of 25,000 people on Facebook <laughs> essentially reminding me of all the mistakes I've ever made. So I can't help but just like admit to them publicly. Like I, it's, it's natural to me. Uh, and we really run smart. Well, we're very transparent in everything we do. And then we still get, we still get accused like, Oh, fraud. Yeah. They're like, you're trying to rip us off. They're doing all this other stuff. I'm like, I like how many CEOs have a TikTok channel? Like I just go around and I'll just film stuff we're doing. Like the amount of transparency we have at our company is unparalleled. Like we have we have more transparency than any other co- company, especially a startup where everything you're t- you're terrified that stealth it, stealth right yeah. yeah you're terrified that a competitor's gonna steal something. You don't want people to know about your product development like. You know, from from the very beginning when I took over the IP of Anki, like it has been like very, yeah, very transparent. Everything from our Kickstarter that we did, where we upgraded the, um, you know, upgraded uh, the 
the software to where we've made it more open source the, the point where we've really you know taken a platform and taken in that taken a robot and turn it into a platform and really like not only a well, platform but like the like, hilarious thing about cosmo i thought is everybody got it for their kids <laughs> and then, and, but then they play with it so more than the kid yeah 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 100 percent Vector, the average age of a Vector user is like about 25 years old. Nice. So, yeah, so I mean, it's it's already up there. Cosmo, to a certain extent, is, is younger, but, you know, Vector is the next incarnation of Cosmo, right? And so, um, it's it's just fascinating, um, the evolution. You go from, you know, one set, and then three years later, now you have a lot more machine learning AI associated with it. And to the point where they are two very distinct products. They, they're very different now. And we're making both, right? Yeah, that's what I've heard. I haven't gotten a good look at Vector up close and personal yet. I would like to. Yeah, I should. Yeah. I, I, I had mine at home. I should have brought it. But, oh, it's uh, all good. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so, yeah, we had, so... That's the thing is, like, you know, we have... We've been very scrappy, you know, funding essentially out of cash flow. We have some investors who've stepped up here locally. Nice. But for the most part, like, we have to be very honest and open about our mistakes or, or else, you know, we won't survive them, right? And and that's just it, even even whenever we talk about internally. And I guess we just have really high standards the more I'm thinking about this because, um, you know, we talk about culture all the time and, and you know, anytime there's, like, something that someone says passive-aggressive, we deal with it, it you know, directly immediately, or someone's something doing something aggressively, you know, where where we deal with it immediately. It's I guess we're also extremely transparent in everything we do internally. So the idea I guess I can't I'm beating this dead horse to death, but it's all this, good. This, but the but the <laughs> idea is like the the fact that you wouldn't be transparent um, unless you're running you know military organization. I can see both sides like of that. that. Yeah. I mean like yeah. SK because it's an agency. I mean like a lot of that is like we're incredibly serious about maintaining the secrecy of our clients' projects sure. because they care and, right. and you want to make your clients' interests your own right. and so you care. But right. then, I mean, yeah, I talk about my journal on my podcast. I fucking record one of these every week yeah. and release it and I'm very honest about who I am and, you know, I, I maybe tell an off-color joke or two and I, I try to be open and honest and, and just wear my heart on my sleeve and I think that's a better way to live your life. I agree. I, I tend to agree with that. Um, because, you know, lies just, they just catch up. Like, you can't, especially in this day and age. It's cumbersome. Right? Every, everything is monitored, right? So it's not even, it's just like common sense. Like, just just for this peace of mind, just try to, you know, tell the truth. <laughs> because it's going to it's gonna find you one way or the other. Um, so, yeah, the, but, yeah, so getting back to, uh, yeah, taking over the IP, like introducing these various uh, revenue streams, I, you know, finding the right people, uh, just getting the right team together, uh, just having the right, executing the right plan, people working remotely because we were shut down for so long. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's just an unbelievable uh, journey we've gone through to get here. Uh, just finally, I feel like we have, that's just it. Now we're finally like, oh, you know, just, just pushing the robots and, Getting them produced and out the door, and whoo, it's been one heck of a uh, two years. Just do you do you do the production in house, or is that contract manufacturers? I would think we probably we've done every, so. We started from scratch, so all the tooling we we redid it. I mean everything. Now now we're making stuff over in Shenzhen, right? In China, yeah, it makes sense. The assembly is and all of our it's where most of the world's manufacturing appears to be. Yeah, and you know our, we 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 store our stuff in a warehouse and all. Kong and we have all that stuff and um, long story short though we're making stuff over there and then the butter robot though for Rick and Morty is being made in, in Taiwan. Interesting. Yeah, so we so we have different manufacturers yeah. in different places. What's the reason for that? If I can ask, I mean, you just have to just tell di- me. just diversity because yeah. I saw when I saw when I saw COVID happening and I saw supply chain disruptions, I needed to diversify Makes sense. manufacturers just in case one got sucked under versus the other. For sure. Like if Taiwan gets invaded, for instance, I mean, is one potential danger. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, after, now, after the whole thing didn't work out for Russia. But some embargo <laughs> with China and then Shenzhen is fucked. I mean, there could be any number of things. And it looks like it is right now because you look at how many... 
digital digital lockdown after lockdown after lockdown and i and i don't want to get too political but it's no, almost I like try not to be as well yeah but, <laughs> but it's almost like intentional like yeah now they have a device the government just in general now has a device where lockdown you know they just yeah. stop you just especially over there with an authoritative regime we're shutting you down uh you know one of our guys we have on the ground said well, they had one case and they shut down like the whole city like why? Like you, just after a while, you start thinking. Uh, okay. There might be an ulterior motivation Correct. here. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I really do think there are. There's some. There's definitely something like that happening to a certain extent. Um, yeah. Anyway, but that's that's. That wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's that's again geopolitical stuff, and again more reason to try to diversify. Makes and, sense. And and have more than just one manufacturer. Yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan of Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I need to go. That chassis for that robot was made in Taiwan. Oh, okay. That's, that's <laughs> cool. Yeah, I, I want to go. I've been to, been to China. Didn't really like China that much. I loved Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, but man, China, China, man, I haven't been yet. Yeah. I, I you feel, feel stepped, stepped on. on. Immediately, yeah, like, I immediately, immediately felt, felt like, like um, I, I can't, can't do anything, anything I want. Like, like there's, there's this fear. Interesting. There's this fear. It's, it's, it's subtle, but it's there. You know, it's well, like, like the, the, the perception of, like, if I were to do this thing, there would be consequences? Or, okay. Yeah, yeah like, um, uh, yeah, yeah, just, 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 yeah, just this idea that... Like, did you ever see that BBC umbrella dance? dance? Like, there was, um, there was a reporter that was trying to do a piece on Tiananmen Square on, you know, obviously the dude with the tank and all that mm -hmm. crap, you know, but, like, um... There were people that just kept opening umbrellas and obfuscating the shot, trying to make the footage unusable. You know, and, and he's talking and doing his piece on the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square Massacre, and people just keep, you know, like, oh, it was, it was weird, subtle, like it wasn't overtly violent or anything like that, but it was, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't been exposed to that culture a whole lot, but that buddy of mine from Beijing showed me that. that yeah. You know, thinking, yeah. Gee, yeah, when I was in college, I... I um, my little piece of hacktivism was that I, I had a um, proxy server so that guy could browse the internet without having to deal with the, uh, you know, the censorship. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you just run into, like, you run into production delays and you wonder, okay, is this production delay really real or is it just simply because there's a competing product out there that's just you're messing with us, right? Yeah, maybe someone has a cousin or an uncle. Or bribe some or official. Whatever. You never yeah. know. And it, and, and that's just it, where I do think long term, we really as a country need to get manufactured back over here. Yeah. And I'm really trying to do everything I can to try to get that to happen. I don't know if no, I'm a big fan. fan. I mean, I, I, I mean, we, we can, can make, make, we can make the robots as it is right now in, in our shop. I mean, we can. Uh, we've built out that shop enough and have so much infrastructure that, you know, it's crazy. So, uh, yeah. I think automation is the only way to compete with the lower wage labor, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. I think if we had an assembly line and put all that together, I think you know we could really make a go out of it. But, but yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll see. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it's been interesting working on those kind of projects recently, um, and it's something I've been. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, I'm. I didn't used to really care, you know, like about like Made in America or any of that stuff, and I, I thought like, you know, what does it matter? Like, I'm a citizen of the world. But then, you know, I don't know. I mean. It kind of feels good to be able to, you know, just like, you know, help your team out. <laughs> just like, you know, like let's. let's I've done more. I've done a lot worse, uh, especially since the, with the whole advent of the, you know, the the knockoff products that are out there. You got these Indiegogo campaigns, and you have this like you have these companies that are public companies that are egregiously stealing U.S. IP, but then. Using the NASDAQ to essentially fund their theft. Like, Brutal. They're, oh, it's just the cycle. They're going, they're taking, they're ripping off their IP, then they're making a uh, mobile company, then they're going to the same people that they stole from, and then you just have this, this cycle. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. And, yeah. And, you know, they need to start calling people on it. And at long last, like, the SEC is cracking down on how long it took. They're like, yeah, we need to audit you. Like, you need to start. You know, we need to start auditing your auditors because we don't trust what's going on. And like, no, yeah, no kidding. Like, thanks, it's taking you long enough. But that's that's really what it, it's its own form. Like you're saying, it's its own form of warfare. There is this, you know, using umbrellas. It's subtle. It's not overtly, like you said, overtly violent. 
but, but the, the consequences, consequences are just as, as if you went and you killed an entire city, right? right? You know, you totally look at the look at the, look at the towns from a financial perspective, right? Right. 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 Look, look, yeah. take, take a look at all these Rust Belt towns that just been annihilated. They, they they did it, but they used finances, they used IP theft, they used all these other things versus dropping bombs, right? You know, but they, they they these sinister tactics, which appear like you said, like non-violent really had violent outcomes in my opinion. And I, yeah. we, we really need, in order, to get, in order to get away from that, we need to strip that away and really bring back manufacturing, because that's- Well, you, you need to make it economically advantageous to make shit, I mean, that's the only way to do it, right. is, is to make it where it makes, because like, I mean, I don't know, like we, we've made a lot of shit in China, you know, just because like, it made more financial sense, and you know, so that you do what you gotta do to, you know, increase profits but like at the same time you know I, i've done a lot of work to try to you know make it make sense to make stuff here if that yeah. makes oh, sense yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and it's rough like yeah. this I, I i continue to investigate however i'm getting to the point now where i can see that it almost makes sense with the inflation with all the shutdowns and things like that you, talk, you look at like cost time cost of money you start looking at all these other um you start taking a look at um, just your ratios, your expenses, your cost of capital, on and on and on. You start examining all those things. Guess what? It starts making a lot of sense um, to think about bringing stuff back to the U.S. Well, I mean, one example of that, I think, is um, there's a startup that... that um, my firm has done some work with, which is uh, they have their aluminum extrusion custom made in the U.S. because it makes with the recycling fees and some of the other. And I'm not a. I mean, as somebody that studied business in school as well, like I'm not a big fan of government sanctions and regulations on, and basically just taxing and you know trade. I I think is a little bit manipulative, but at the mm. same time. You know, because of these sanctions, it made more sense to have this extrusion made in Ohio than it did to have it made in China. And so that was kind of cool that, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, all right, locally sourced. You know? Yeah. And yeah. then I have a, a relative who is uh, recently retired as the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And um, one of the things he said when he was on Mad Money is, well, we make everything locally. I mean, for our German, you know, customers, we make stuff in Germany. For our Chinese customers, we make stuff in China. You know, for the Spanish market, we make stuff over there. Like a big fan of sourcing locally. Like it keeps down, you know, the cost of trade and the cost of, you know, transportation. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, yeah, true. It's yeah. true. There's yeah, there's a lot of arbitrage out there. That's for and sure. And I'm probably you know mincing his words. I don't mm. need to get this wrong if you're yeah, listening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, hmm. But yeah, that's that's kind of. Yeah, these are things I ponder late at night, right? Like, yeah, I'm stuck with what I have. I have the tools that I have, and I'm, and I'm doing what I can do. Um, but uh, As we all are. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, okay, I can aspire to something. Are you going to, there's that event down in Philadelphia. The, Wait, which one is that? Uh, there's a robotics event. Um, it's uh, It runs from, um, let's see, Monday to uh, Friday. This so. coming week? Yes, yeah, coming week. Yeah. So that'll be a week ago if you're <laughs> the release schedule. Hold on, let, but, me, uh, let me let me pull it up real quick. I'd be interested because Philly's kind of a cool town, and then I have family in New York, so I could go say hi to them while I'm out there. Let's forget what the the old. Uh, hold on, let me let me pull up. Um... Yeah, sure. Yeah, oh, you should check it out. You should really check it out. Um... Like a manufacturing? I, I, I C R A. So, I C R A. It's an interesting uh, F L A. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got that? Yeah, I see. Four letter acronym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What does that sound for? Like, what is, what's the event about? International Wilson? Conference. God, the hiccups are like crazy. Oh, uh, no worries. I poured a really stiff drink yeah. here, so. 
It's the, international uh, conference. Yeah, the tolerance is higher than it should be. Yeah, international conference of robotics and automation. Interesting. Yeah, that seems like fun. Yeah, and, and anyway, um, you know, we're we're we have a, a series A we're putting together, and I have a lead, and you know, we need to fill out the round, and you know, people call it raising money, I call it begging, um, and it's just you know, we're just going and. Uh, I was thinking about maybe starting a finance startup actually at some point in the not too distant future. So I'd be interested to get your perspectives on that because. That's been sort of my reason I haven't done it yet, is because it feels weird to be beholden to a board. But um, one of my buddies, um, who I won't name just in case it's going to get him in trouble in some way, has been increasingly convincing me over coffee to uh, to maybe take a business idea I've had for a while and um, finance it and you know raise like you know pre-seed seed series a sure and, and do it that way so what what's your opinion on this like i'd be interested i mean i hate it um okay i really don't i really hate it um that's why i haven't done it is i feel like i would it really takes it takes a lot of energy and then you are not tending to the business brutal and i can see the bad i can just see how it has hurt our company yeah. With me not paying attention to the company and me, you know, looking over here, that's one trade off. At the same time, you are learning more about your business as you're pitching because you're getting feedback and yeah. the person will have you thought of this, have you thought of this, have you thought of this? So then you're like, okay, you take that, you take it back, and then you kind of incorporate it into your business model now, and that's kind of like the feedback you give back. That's to pretty cool. Employees. That's the fringe benefit I didn't think of. It is, yeah. I mean, the obvious one is velocity, so just getting that kind of a cash injection. Right. I mean, you can hire heavy hitters and move faster, but yeah, that's that's the one thing that we we really need, uh, have needed for a while. Are just like you know, we have awesome people at Digital Dream Labs. Yeah, and we yeah. really I mean, need the people I've met off your team. I've liked. I mean, they're they're great. We really need someone who is a chief operator, though, like a honest to god. That's like, an important uh, role. Yes. I have so much respect for like a COO, like a like a chief. You know, whatever they want to call it, operations chief, yeah, yeah. Um, executor. I mean, yes. like somebody that gets shit done and and stays up, you know, all night to you know just make sure the unglamorous nitty gritty details, you know, get tended to Correct. and things work like clockwork. Right, and see, and that's kind of where I am. Uh, I'm stuck between two worlds because the nitty gritty stuff you lose the vision. And then if you have too much vision, you're ignoring the details which are important, and you're 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 stuck in this dichotomy. At least that's where I'm stuck right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, for me, uh, with SK, it was always the um, I say, I mean, you know, it it basically comes down to this divide between sales and operations, and that was I mean, but it's an agency, so it's a different business model. But I guess vision is sort of akin to sales, and nitty gritty is sort of akin to operations. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, and there's also this struggle too between you know marketing and the engineers, right? The product development versus going going to market. Well, here here's an about. interesting piece, which is if I start this product company, I haven't decided if I want to be a founder CEO or a founder CTO yet, or a founder CEO yet. Like I've. I'm pretty sure I can do all those jobs, but like you definitely, like you said, I mean, you need to focus and you're not going to be good at the other stuff if you do the one thing and you need someone who's willing to fall on a grenade for the other thing if you want to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah, and you know, just because you're good at, let's say, you know, writing scripts or, you know, you name it, um, doesn't mean you should be a CTO. Like, managing uh, programmers or managing engineers is very different than being an engineer. Yeah. Right? And so... No, I completely agree. I yeah. mean, and... and you know, as you know, an engineering director. I mean, it's 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 a totally different set of skills, and it's one that I think I'm actually better at. Well, I'm I'm good at making things, but I'm I much more enjoy working with people and motivating folks to make things. And so, sorry, that was very no, introspective. No, 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 no. No, that's it's true. No, you're saying that out loud, and I'm just thinking, you know. It, I don't know if I go out and if I motivate people enough, right? I don't know if I um, am inspirational. 
I, I just hope that, you know, my actions and hopefully the way I carry myself and the fact that I'm passionate and enthusiastic, I'm hoping that it rubs off on people. Yeah. I've always, like, if you do, like, a like a, like a speech, like, a, let's go win team, like... Uh, I mean, sometimes you need that. Like, I don't know if I'm good at it, though. That's the yeah. thing. Like, I just don't know. Yeah. I feel like I'm pretty good at those. <laughs> but, like, I... <laughs> It's, I mean, it, it, you definitely, like, you have to tap into a weird sort of alternate persona. Like, it, it's it's mm-hmm. kind of bizarre, right? I mean, like, I, I this is kind of stupid, but I, I, I like to use, like, military analogies. And, like, I haven't done a whole lot of, I mean, we've built navigational devices for the military, but that's about it. Yeah. And so, um, but, like, I, I study, you know, history a decent amount. And so I'm, like, interested in World War II and... I, I've read a bunch of books from that period, and um, I, I don't know. Like I, I, I like to use analogies, you know, like to that, and I feel like that kind of because I mean, if you can motivate, you know, somebody to go and march into Nazi Germany and you know storm that beach, I mean, you yeah. can motivate someone to do anything. And so, I mean, that, that have you listened to that Churchill speech? You know, like oh, the, which one? Fair <laughs> enough. I, I'm thinking of. Um, you know, we will fight them on the beaches. We will fight oh, yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah exactly. Um, it's one of the most beautiful th- things ever, ever mm-hmm. made. I mean, and mm-hmm. I try to sort of channel that. Like, th- there's a ring I'm not wearing today, but it, it's my grandfather's, and he was the chief mining engineer for procurement of oil for the D-Day invasion of Normandy. And when I'm having issues with self-esteem, I will wear that ring to try to just imagine I'm that guy a little bit and, and, and channel that, you know, in my work and, mm-hmm. and think of that, you know, and, and it's, it, it's stupid and it's a little bit of a pretender thing, but it, it makes mm-hmm. me feel, I think I'm able to inspire people better when I, when I tap into that. Okay. Yeah. I believe, yeah, there's energies out there. That's for sure. Whether, you know, whether you're religious or spiritual or something like that, there are things I think we can tap into that we don't fully understand. Right. Like, sure. Radio waves 200 years ago, 300 years ago, if you played a radio, they would have burned you at the stake, right? <laughs> like, you know, for witchcraft. So can you imagine the things we're still not, we still don't know? Right? Yeah. There's all, I'm sure there's, there's all, a ton of them. I mean, well, it's infinite. Well, and they have, like, this is super weird. Did you, this this morning they were playing um, the sounds of the, the, the black hole at the center of the universe. Did you, did you, or the, of our galaxy? It's fucking creepy. Interesting. But, but the, the gravity, How did they interpolate that? Yeah, so, sound? so the gravity waves coming okay. from the black hole basically have a frequency, which then they're basically taking that and then... Moving it a few octaves over to make it audible? That's right. Okay. That's right. And it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, you know, scary movie weird. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's a it's really well, like a whale. It's almost yeah. It, it, I it, there's nothing really like it. It's that's interesting. Really weird. Yeah, check it out. But yeah, I would like to. But that's just it. No, I, I don't think that's that's corny or cheesy at all. I Thanks. think I I, um, I the I ring think, is ridiculous. It's 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 three snakes that are like curl around your finger, and then they have like white sapphires for eyes. They kind of look like diamonds, but they're really that's like cool. That. That's cool. People comment on it all the time, but sorry, I didn't mean to. No, that's no, not. Yeah. It, it, but I try to find inspiration wherever I can, or putting my struggle. That's what I've been really doing right now, is that putting my struggles in context. Like you know, how we're talking about being privileged and being in the United States and having having this ability to solve problems and how great that is. I just will think about you know my great grandfather fleeing Ukraine getting out of their one-way ticket, saving the money, was hiding the money in the forest because the Cossacks were too fat and lazy to get off their horses. <laughs> so he hid all the money there and then eventually got a one-way ticket out, you know, to the U.S. My parents left Latvia, or my, my great-grandparents left Latvia to come here. Yeah, and you think, you know, they yeah. came in with nothing. You know, they had absolutely zero dollars. And that's just how I look at it. Like, I, the, the problems I have are, you know, developed nations problems right it's yeah. not and sure and, and the, the other thing too is you gotta check check it out it's um um it was warren buffett was talking about it and it was nice he said he was a person was saying like look should i pursue teaching or not because teaching just doesn't pay that much and he said like look if you're just going after obscene wealth like there's a certain ceiling to where you're going to be different from one person to another like 
Like, he said, I'm going to stand in line at a McDonald's or go to Dairy Queen just like you would. Like, there's not... Maybe, okay, maybe I could go buy my own McDonald's maybe, okay? And stay, go and get my own hamburger. But that's a little crazy. Why don't I just go and go and buy a hamburger? <laughs> and he said... He said so, so, like, he started giving examples of, like, like, a person who's just, you know, let's say, quote, unquote, just making, let's say, 35 to... Thirty-five thousand to fifty thousand dollars a year, okay? Yeah. And everything that you would do over the course of that life, and then of course he's at the billionaire range, but he, it was interesting because it's true there are only certain you know portions that make his life dramatically different than than another person. Does he you think about it? Live in like a pretty modest house. Like I've heard. Yeah. Have you seen Berkshire Hathaway's official website ever? No, I, I don't think I've ever it, It's a it. text-based website. It looks like it's out of 1995. They've got an all-text ad for Geico at the footer. Oh, my God. And then, funny. yeah, it's like it's like eight like hyperlinks where like it'll change color if you click it. And then like one of them is a message from Warren Buffett, and it's, it's an ad that just shamelessly shills... Um, Geico and um, some jewelry line. I can't remember exactly. Ber- Berheims, Bersheims, but it, you know he's he's just like you should buy these products. <laughs> it's, just, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's like, just, like, he like just doesn't Dave, give a fuck. Yeah, yeah. like Dave Thompson uh, with the hamburgers. Yeah, Wendy's. Like, um, well, no, but so but that's just it. Like, okay, so all right, I have my car. Okay, you know, maybe you have a Lambo. Okay, like it's just like there's degrees, but. I can still drive the car and get to point A to point B. Or I, in, he, like, okay, he has a private plane, but I can go on Southwest and get to where I need to go too. So it's, it was interesting. So he's, the point he was making is like, look, you ha- don't give up on your dreams or f- you know, who you are, who you think you are, simply because you're going to chase this obscene amount of wealth and, you know, and be miserable. Because the odds are you're going to be miserable longer than those little bright, bright pieces of those bright moments of light that you're on your yacht or you have on your private plane. But then the rest of the time, you're absolutely miserable. <laughs> or so, and, and, and I'll tell you what, it was an interesting way to think about it. Um, that you, you do think about the average person today, at least in the United States, lives a lifestyle that is better than most billionaires at the turn of the century. Like Rockefeller, for example, you take a look at his house, you take a look at everything he had. I mean, shit, my kids have an iPad and like, you know, all these other recouchements, if you will, and they live a better life than Rockefeller did. For sure. sure. You know, I mean, so, access to information, like 100%. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, I guess entertainment. I mean, you can be like a fucking Persian empire and have a thing the next day on Amazon, anything, anywhere in the world, like anything you want. Yeah. You, you want those olives, you want, yeah. you know, a fucking sex toy, right. you want, right? you know, like a, you know, just name it. Like, yeah. it'll be there the next day, yeah. anything. Well, so Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, this is a, 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 a funny, he, one of his missions was to get an orange in the winter. <laughs> yeah, so look this up. Like, he, he had a personal mission. I want to get an orange in the winter time, and he could never pull it off. He just couldn't. So, and, and this guy had access to immense wealth. Like he had fleets of ships. Like if anyone was going to be able to pull off, it was get, that guy. It was that guy. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't do it. Now That's you know. Amazing. Now we, you know, they've orange in the winter all the time. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. for like less than a buck. <laughs> <laughs> So there's, you know, again... For a buck fifty, you get a Sumo Mandarin there, Whole Foods. <laughs> that's right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and so I kind of, you, know, I, 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 you know, I think about those things. Um, but, we, you know, we, 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 do, we, we tend to overlook a lot of that stuff. Yeah, and, um, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, it's, it's better than it's ever been. And, and people want to focus a lot of the time, I think, on, on the negative, you know, on, on, you know, this, you know, I wish I had that over there. And, you know, it's like, dude, you've got... Everything, right. <laughs> like it's in your fingertips. Yeah, well, and I started really feeling that, like, um, when I was just looking around my house, like, and I and I looked at it, and I'm like, you know what, this is enough. Like this, what we have is enough. That's interesting. So. Yeah, but the the other thing too is then, but you want to make sure that that never makes you com- com- comfy or complacent. 
Well, there's... I catch myself from time to time, like, with, like, I don't know, this is going to sound bad, but, like, the money worship and the, like, you want to get as many points as you can, and that's that's a bad way to live your life. Like, I see myself doing it, and I'm just, like, you know, I, I get miserable when I start to fall into that, that trap, as it were. But then when I, when, I, when I chase my passions, when I do things I find interesting, engaging, um intellectually stimulating and good for the world then that's when i'm or, or you know when i'm just going out and like traveling to a country i've never been to before meeting people mm-hmm. like that's when i'm really at my at my happy place you yeah. Know? yeah so yeah. yeah well i think we've solved all the world's problems today <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no i mean you know it's a good good podcast or conversation i mean i feel like these always get philosophical mm-hmm. and um Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's def- definitely no more world hunger. No more. Uh, right. Never gonna be another homeless person. Um, yeah, yeah. Wars. We we did that. Did away with that today. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Famine. Wars. None of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just yeah. I want to try to not devolve into into political rhetoric. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, 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 no. To do I'm that. Not accusing you of anything. No. <laughs> yeah. I just I we could really go there. Um, yeah. But it was it was funny. Um, I, I I have had pick, I've picked up kind of like um, I have a guilty admission. I've been trolling billionaires recently on Twitter, <laughs> but being very polite about it. But just like commenting on stuff, just to see what happens. But then what I'll do is I'll delete it after a while, even if it's <laughs> polite. So that's that's a little you know. I'll I do that on LinkedIn sometimes. Issue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like Twitter just just because it's almost expected. Uh, you know. Like the, the, the trolling um, a little bit but well I like LinkedIn because it's like the most it's like the least addictive social media oh, yeah. and so yeah. I, I found myself spending like two to four hours a day on Facebook I deleted my account maybe six years ago it's, it's not good for you yeah it's exactly well, and that's the whole like, the reason Meta exists is to monopolize or not monopolize but like to, to take as much of your time as they can get yeah. and so um, I don't know I just felt like it wasn't healthy and I'm Best decision ever made, deleting the social media accounts. Yeah, and so unfortunately, I have to, I have to keep them up because we're running social media. And that's how we advertise. It makes sense. Like well, well, and I have had professional colleagues that are smarter than me tell me that I should get a Twitter account. And so, <laughs> I mean, you know, just it's for shits and giggles. Yeah, I, I yeah. highly recommend it. But you have to, you have to have the sense of detachment too. Interesting. You really do. You have to have, you have to have this ability to detach. Which is very difficult for a company like like you know Digital Dream Labs, where I've put a lot of my heart and soul into it, and it becomes like a child. It's an extension of. Well, you. That's, that's exactly how it feels owning a business for me too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 that's what I always wonder, like you like know, like I would almost like take a bullet for SK. It's weird, you know, and it's like I know I created it, and you know, like it only exists because I, I put it there. But at the same time, like I feel like I owe it a lot, and. I don't want it to, to get hurt. You know, it's, it's weird. I, I know. I, I totally agree with you. And it's fascinating how other people in the company feel the same way and how much they're willing to sacrifice. Sure. And you just wonder, is it healthy? And <laughs> I'm serious. Like, you yeah, know, I've been like, laughing because I agree. Yeah, you know? like, yeah, like, like, should I be doing this? I, and that's the other thing, too. I've, I, I, can, I continue to have this existential, cri- not crisis, but question you know i'll ask god or the universe or something like that like should i keep doing this or am i doing the right thing do i keep going forward do i keep am i am i doing the right thing by doing this like you know it's been 10 years now you know the company we keep we keep going and marching forward is that the right thing and it's weird you know how how in you know the the uh the lord's prayer the in daily bread, you know, the, 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 there's that line in there that says daily bread. And I swear, when I ask that question, I get daily bread. Like something will arrive. What is, what is daily bread? I was so raised Jewish. Us, yeah, yeah. yeah, give us give us this day our daily bread. So it's just enough to survive, just yeah. to make it through the next day. So okay. our Father wrote in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay. Okay. So let me let me get through this. Like you know, if I 
let me get through the day. Right. Basically, is what that says. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay. Just enough so I don't starve to death. Yeah. And any time I've like had that kind of like openness with the universe or uh, God or what have you, I get that daily bread, and it tells me, okay, I am on the right course. Keep keep mar- keep, keep moving forward. I'm doing the right thing. And because I think it's it's you know the the saying that doubt kills more than fear ever will. And I really <laughs> that's almost it. like the only thing to fear is fear itself. I mean, yeah. Right, so that's just it. It's like in the other sayings, like okay, everything you want is on the other side of fear. And I, I, I totally agree with. That. I like that actually. Yeah, everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. Well, when you are able to suspend fear, I mean, think of the things that you've accomplished. You yeah. Know? And so, like, uh, I'll look back sometimes on things that I'm like, how the fuck did I do that? You know, like how how did that get? Um, oh, right, I wasn't afraid, and I just just went for it. Well, right, yeah, and that's just the one thing one saying I really despise is like, do something that terrifies you every day or scares you every day. I'm like, I live in a constant state of terror. <laughs> like, I just have learned to I can barely it. sleep at night. I told you I got four hours. Yeah, yeah <laughs> because it, I mean, that's just it. You're in a constant state of alert and yeah. you have to be able to suspend that. And that that's something I don't, I, I don't think people truly understand because I'll see criticisms of uh, entrepreneurs. I'll see criticisms of billionaires. I'll see sure, all the time. Right? But the, what, what people fail Those to... Those people grasp, haven't tried to do it themselves. <laughs> you, you will crumble under the fear yeah. that you go through to get there. Well, the problem is, like, everybody is like, you know, you, you're living this privileged life. But, like, if, if you were to attempt to do that job, like, you would probably kill yourself from the stress... Like it is, it is, it's not a job that I don't think a lot of people would want if they knew what it actually entailed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even, to, I mean, I, I'm not a billionaire, but I own a business. And so like, I mean, it's, it's incredibly stressful. I mean, it's, it's, but you know, it's a labor of love. Right. <laughs> but I, I don't think, I mean, I was talking to a few people the other day, like this was yesterday. And I, I just was hanging out with some neighbors and. Somebody, Somebody said, said I'm bored. bored, and I'm like, that is not a luxury that I can afford myself. You know, like, boredom. Like, why, how the hell could I even begin to arrive at that conclusion, you know? I mean, that's just not... I would love to be bored. Yeah, that's, that's almost a non sequitur to me. Like, it's such a luxury to have bored right now. But at the same time, it's life I chose, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Chose, we chose these lives. So what I've noticed is how much the stress level... When we were puttering along and, like, you know, just like... Puttering's a great word. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, just like, it's around six figures, you know, decent, income, happy, and then, you know, we jump to seven figures. You know, okay, a little bit more aggressive, things like that. Here, this this year, we're getting into the you know, eight-figure realm. I'm starting to feel it. Now. <laughs> yeah. well, there's that feeling of, like, okay, you've taken this money, and you've got to deliver. I mean... Like, okay, so what is that for you? Like, what, what is that? Like, what's the difference between six and seven and eight? Where, like, that's, that's real. Yeah. yeah. I haven't made that kind of money. So, like, I'm interested. That's interesting. You have real enemies. So there's, again, I keep, I keep, you know, we keep opening these fortune cookies and reading these, like, sayings. But, like, like the other one is, like, friends come and go and enemies accumulate. And, uh, and you start getting to see true greed. Like, like that's, that's fascinating. fascinating. True, unadulterated, pure greed, and the evil that goes along with it. I don't think a lot of people talk about this because no, uh, this is a conversation I have on a daily basis for sure. This is fascinating. Yeah, the yeah, the yeah, and then the egos that are associated with it. That is a killer. To it. For sure. Yeah, it's like it's the greed. It's the money is the drug that feeds the greed that then expands the ego. And you will... I catch myself sometimes falling victim to that. And, you know, I I consider myself lucky to have been knocked down a peg a few times. And, like, that that humbles you. And that's a good thing because I think, you know, you... you, But sometimes, you know, I'm like, you know, like, oh, yeah, I, I made X amount of dollars. Like, I'm somehow better for it and that's 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 a trap like that's there's no 
What, what other metric, metric is there, though? That's the unfortunate thing. We, yeah. we don't have another a metric in, in, in this universe with this, in this, uh, this, uh, um, the, the, uh, the, no, no, no. To, to really measure success or impact on a person's life. Like, if, 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 like, Apple shuttered its business, everyone would feel the impact the next day. It'd be, yeah. a, it'd be a story that would last for months, right? Sure. Whereas if, let's say, Clavon's ice cream parlor, yeah. It's, it's not, not years. Good. I mean, everybody still knows about all of us. So. Yeah. Yeah, or like, look at what, let's say, Clavon's, which is, is a darling, um, and people love that place, and it's an icon, et cetera. But the rest of the planet would move on and not even recognize sure. it, right? And you do get to the point where revenue separates relevance in the world, you know? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Because you have a multi-billion dollar company, you've touched a lot of people's lives. You, you, and this is what's really hard to hear, even from a small business perspective, is that if you are a six-figure business, you, have, you haven't really touched that many people's lives. Sure. But do you care? Like, that's the other thing, too. Is, <laughs> no, but like, you know, maybe I just care about me and my family, and that's it. I don't, yeah. I don't need to. This laundromat's awesome. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah I don't need to change the planet, you know? I don't need to be an Elon Musk to, like, you know, go to Mars, etc. cetera. So, um, but there is, you know, there is this idea of when, when you're right in that graduating scale and that, like, Things get deadly serious, um, and I can and I felt it like to the point where, well, Jacob, you're not a true robotist. You're not part of our club. Oh, Jacob, you know what? You didn't take formal VC money. You know, you're not part of that club either. Like, you know, there are these clubs, and there's this way things are supposed to be done. I, I've always that said that, that, like, you know, the the Pittsburgh robotics scene is a bit of a good old boys club. And so, I, well, everything I think is a good old, like in some fashion because I get that shit too. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. But we all experience it in some fashion, but I see it more and more. Like, okay, well, you haven't done this, so therefore we're going to exclude you because you haven't played, you haven't shown us that you've played the game. And there's, I can definitely start seeing that as uh, the, the, the profile of the company continues to escalate. Like, uh, it, it just, it's, it's just very apparent. Um, and again, it's just the way it is. Like, I'm, I'm not complaining. Like, complaining, there's no, there's no point in me yeah, complaining doesn't, about it. Yeah, it doesn't really... <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, Again's. that's been my experience, is that, that, you know, when... And hopefully someone who listens to this will be like... And then, then that one day when they're like, I know ha he did know what he was talking about, so, <laughs> so you know maybe they'll be better prepared and be able to adapt to whatever you know whatever happened. Uh, but there's yeah, that's that's definitely the graduated scale, and I can only imagine once you start hitting billions, because you can just see the the barrage of attacks once you. That's interesting. Okay, so you become a target to go, from governments. When when I was at SpaceX, we would get hit with. Like, North Korea would design viruses specifically for SpaceX, where it was, like, coded into it in the name and the variables. Like, they decompile in the information security department. And, like, you'd be like, oh, shit, we're a target. <laughs> like, this is... This is... Because it's it's a perfect missile design, you know? The, yeah. the Falcon rocket at the time. Yeah. I mean, now Starship, but... You know, that, that was... That was pretty serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just interesting. But, yeah, you can see... It's a graduated scale. The, the level of enemies, the level of seriousness. You know, it it cha it it changes rapidly. So that's interesting. Yeah, so that's one thing I've noticed. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about that as much. Um, probably because I haven't done business on the scale that you have. But I've been forced into it. It's yeah. not not like I. You know, so that's just it. We had to grow, and it was a choice I made. Um, you know, in order to like say, are right, we setting our sights on this? That's that's what we're gonna do. Yeah. Well, I admire that. I mean, you know, like I, I, I said when we kind of started this, I mean, it seems like you're very good at, at inheriting a thing and then going and making it profitable, which takes a strategic mentality. And, and you know, uh, uh, you got to be a realist, I think, to be able to make that work. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're just kind of masturbating. And so I have a lot of respect for that. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah.
a lot of other people don't. <laughs> it's just it's 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 fascinating to see the um, the the swath of um, bad reviews that you know we we get all the time. Like, well, they didn't do this or they didn't do that. I'm like, dude. I mean, if I could, I would. Right? <laughs> I, you and I both agree. Um, you and I are like that. Thanks for the one star, uh, but you know, I I already I already get it. I got it. So. Yeah, uh, sorry, man. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, I don't want this to turn to a bitch fest. Yeah, so. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Wait, this was fun. I, yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. It's a good yeah. note to end on. Yeah. Is there anything you want to plug while we're here? Anything you want to talk about? Anything that's uh, like a yeah, final I word? I want to plug. Yeah, well, go visit us. Uh, we have a, a website, a new website we're launching. Uh, so it'll be much more streamlined. Uh, you'll be able to find our products more. Really focusing on direct to consumer. So you can www.digitaldreamups.com. But the thing I really want to plug is Cosmo and Friends. So co go to YouTube, type in Cosmo and Friends, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Um, and do that for Clever the Sponsor Cross too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's it. That's that's it. That's it. Dude, Jacob, it, thank you. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, same here. Yeah. It was fun. Thank you.